Okay, hey everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Hope everybody's doing good today. Uh, all right, so today the topic is Super Collider and MIDI. So we're going to talk about the MIDI protocol a little bit and how it integrates with Super Collider and how we can get MIDI into Super Collider in particular and use it to uh, control stuff in Super Collider like sound, for example. So, um, yeah, let's do a quick sound check. And you can let me know if you can hear me and if you can hear my pink noise. Hopefully that's uh, working. I think I've got levels in OBS here. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you don't see anything, I think you just maybe refresh the stream because uh, uh, I guess we got some people who can see. And it looks fine from my end. Um, all right. So let's just... Uh, good. Thank you, Pierre. Glad to hear it. Okay. Let's just talk very briefly about what MIDI is. Uh, I I think it's sort of a safe assumption that everyone watching has used MIDI at some point in the past to to you know work on sound in some way as a, as a control device. Uh, but you know, we'll just just quickly. I, I just want to emphasize the point that MIDI is not sound. Okay, well, good. Some people have no idea what MIDI is. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And it's a digital communications specification or protocol uh, that was uh, released to the public in 1983. Um, and uh, the key fact about MIDI is that it is not sound. Uh, it's, it's very easy to make the mistake of thinking that MIDI is somehow equivalent to sound because in most, maybe not most, but many, many pieces of audio software, you open them up and you have a MIDI controller, usually a keyboard, and you play it like a piano and sound comes out. And it feels like the controller is actually producing the sound and the protocol is producing the sound. But it's just a little bit more subtle than that. What's coming out of the controller is just digital data, which arguably almost has nothing to do with sound. It's, uh, it's the receiving device, which needs to be MIDI compliant as well. It receives messages, and it's up to that device, whether it's hardware or software. In most cases, a DAW like Pro Tools or Logic or Ableton to apply the incoming control data to sound processes. And uh, we'll, we'll see some like sort of a reinforcement of that as we get into the lecture today. So it's not sound. It's a control protocol commonly used to create, control, manipulate sound processes sort of indirectly. Um, yeah, it's MIDI is just individual messages which arrive as just little packets of bytes, you know, just two or three bytes at a time, just a bunch of zeros and ones. Yeah, so, um, right, so very quickly, um, uh, MIDI is... Uh, Actually, no. I mean, there are messages which are called note on and note off messages. Uh, but there are also, you know, messages which are less directly related to sound itself. In fact, you know, I'm going to, I have a little, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, this this here, I have a little tree, which I made up a while ago, which I sometimes show to some of my classes, to show you a sort of hierarchy of MIDI messages. The, the data, the the definition of how data is packaged and sent in the MIDI protocol. There's two broad categories, channel messages and system messages, which further subdivide into voice and mode messages under channel, and uh, real-time common and system exclusive messages under system messages. I really don't think there's any point in going into too much detail here. As a user, as a creator of sound art, um, the MIDI messages that you end up commonly working with are these here. So we have the note messages, note on, note off. 
And there are things called control change or continuous controller or just CC messages. There's something called program change, there's pitch bend, and then there's two different types of what's called aftertouch. Um, for this video, I, I, I am planning on only covering note on and off, continuous controller, and possibly also pitch bend if we get to it, because these are arguably the most common of these six very common messages. There's so much more to the MIDI specification that meets the eye, and you know it's a subject in and of itself, but uh, that's, that's all I'm gonna sort of cover for now. So, and, and MIDI is not just used to control sound. There's something, there's various subsets of the MIDI specification. There's something called MIDI show control, which is a collection of MIDI messages that are commonly used to control a lighting board, and you know MIDI is just data. It's just data and as long as two devices are MIDI compliant, meaning they can send, receive, and understand MIDI messages, you can get MIDI to do anything. I mean you know it's, it doesn't have to be sound. Okay so uh, what I've got here is an M-Audio Oxygen 49 keyboard controller. Uh, it's got 49 keys or I think it's 49, oh, it's right there. yeah, 49 keys. It has, all the way on the left here, what's called a pitch wheel. So this is for, uh, is, this sends pitch bend MIDI messages. Again, it does not necessarily have to bend the pitch of some sound. It can, and it commonly is used to do that. And then, uh, let's see, I've got this continuous controller wheel. It's also called the modulation wheel, or just mod wheel. And then I have nine faders sort of right here. I have eight knobs right here. And then a variety of buttons right here, a few here. And the mod wheel and these faders, buttons, and knobs send uh, CC messages. They are continuous controllers. And then the keys uh, send a note on message when they're pressed down, and they send a note off message when they are released. Uh, and then we also have these eight pads which also send note on messages and note off messages. So note on, note off. Yeah, so these, I do have two similar wheels, but they are not both pitch bend. The one all the way on the left is pitch bend. And as, I don't know if you can see, it's really far in the background here, but if you bring it down and then let go, it snaps back to the middle. And if you bend it up, it snaps back to the middle. So this sends pitch bend messages. This does not. This is a, just a simple continuous controller. It sends the same class of data as all these faders and all these knobs. Right, so uh, all, will, all will hopefully make sense shortly, but I just wanted to show more up close what we're actually working with here, because I know we got this tiny little camera in the corner. It's not always easy to see what's going on. Okay, so uh, let's see, where were we? Okay, so let's say we, we've got a controller. It's connected to your computer. A lot of MIDI controllers are so-called class compliant, uh, the, in layman's terms, plug and play. You just plug them into your computer, they get power from your computer, and they automatically send MIDI when you interact with them. That's one of these devices. Some devices, mostly older MIDI devices, you actually need to install a software driver on your computer in order for the computer to recognize the device. But uh, this is class compliant. And for everyone actually taking the class, it's gonna be in class tomorrow, the Alesis Q25s are class compliant as well. So they're plugged into the iMacs in the, in the lab, but you can also just plug them into your computer. And at least for Mac OS, I think they should just, they should just work. So once you've got that connected uh, and plugged into your computer, we're in Super Collider. The first thing we're gonna do is uh, access a class called MIDI Client and we're going to say dot init, short for initialize. Uh, and let's run this line. And you can see that we've got some information in the post window. Essentially what this, um, what this uh, line does is it uh, sort of gives a, a nudge to the operating system's application that manages uh, MIDI devices, that, you know, the, however your operating system sees available sources and destinations, and it says, what do you got? And the operating system responds with a list of sources and destinations. And right now I've got two sources and two destinations. Uh, technically, I, it's just two devices, and both of them can both uh, send 
MIDI data. They can act as sources of data. And you can also send data to these uh, MIDI objects. So there's the IAC driver, which stands for Inter-Application Communication Driver. That's a built-in software thing. It allows you to send MIDI internally from software to software. Uh, why, why is the keyboard a destination? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, that's actually a very good question. Generally speaking, this is a controller, and it's just meant to be a source of MIDI. But uh, many MIDI devices, uh, they uh, are programmable in some way. Like if you wanted to somehow go in and, and change the notes that these pads corresponded to, you know, maybe there's a way to do it here. But uh, generally speaking, the system exclusive messages are part of the protocol in order to allow manufacturers and users to customize their devices. So, you know, devices will sometimes respond in very specific ways to a certain system exclusive message. You know, if you send it a certain sysx message, it'll say, oh, okay, so now I'm going to reprogram myself in this way. So it is possible to send MIDI to this controller, but it would be a pretty uh, uh, unusual thing to do, way less common than actually receiving MIDI. Uh, yeah, that's another that's another reason. They're like the uh, the um, Akai MPC, the giant thing of pads that is sort of associated with Ableton Live. Uh, it it also needs to know the state of things happening uh, in the computer. And so, like if you if you actually click on something in the computer, like in a DAW, the device wants to know that something has been updated. So sometimes the computer will send MIDI to the device and tell it to update its display. Sort of exactly what what Pierre is pointing out here. So, although it is possible to send MIDI, we're not going to do any of that. This is, from a, a basic user perspective, not really something that receives MIDI. It just acts as a MIDI source. So that's the first thing we do. Uh, and uh, then the next thing we do is we, we go to a, an object called MIDI in. Look up the help file for this. And uh, this is a, a general purpose class for receiving MIDI, although uh, there's like n n no fewer than like four or five warnings throughout the MIDI documentation that says don't use this class directly for actually receiving MIDI messages. Uh, but we do use it to tell uh, Super Collider to connect all, which basically tells it uh, connect to all of your MIDI sources because this is the MIDI in class. So it just it just means if anything, if any of your devices send MIDI, receive it. And so we're going to do this and and you know nothing really much happens. We do see that the it, this returns the class MIDI in. That's just sort of a, a side effect here. But after running these two lines, uh, you're sort of good to go. You're ready to start actually receiving MIDI data in and doing stuff with it. Um, so this is your initialization block. You just run this once. When you start it up, and there's no there's no need to ever run this clump again. Technically, there's no harm in running it again, but you just you don't actually need to run it again uh, multiple times. Okay. Uh, right now, let's um, this, there's a few uh, help files which are are useful here. Um, if we just look at there's a, a document just simply called MIDI. Yeah, MIDI. It is a practical usage overview. It tells you a little bit about receiving MIDI input, sending MIDI output. It's This is more like sort of a table of contents. It's not too much going on here, but there is also a using MIDI file, notes on MIDI support in Super Collider. And uh, so it gives you sort of a rundown of the basic MIDI classes. We've seen MIDI client. Uh, you know, we, we've used MIDI in. There's also, of course, corresponding MIDI out. And this is worth a skim. Uh, and, and here it tells you these, these are the main classes we're going to be using for actually receiving MIDI input. These, these initialization classes are, are useful, and we, we use them specifically in this way. But then we're going to get to MIDI funk and MIDI def. Um, so these are basically equivalent classes, MIDI funk and MIDI def. Um, so they both do the same thing. MIDI def is actually a, a subclass of. Um, of MIDI funk, and it's it's a little. I, I tend to prefer MIDI def because it's like synth def, 
and for new synth steps, we the first thing we provide is a you know a symbol, which is the name of the synth step, and that uh, means we don't have to worry about you know naming my your synth step because it has this symbolic name. And MIDI def uh, uses that same syntax. So um, we'll get into MIDI funk and MIDI def in just a second, but I just want to share one really really cool thing that I learned literally yesterday that I did not know you could do. Um, so you'll see right now we're, we're pressing stuff, we're turning stuff, we're you know playing all sorts of stuff, but nothing's coming in. You, what you can do is uh, MIDI funk or MIDI def, either one works, uh, dot trace, and then in parentheses, true. Okay, so we're gonna run this line, and now every MIDI message that comes in is printed. And uh, let's actually expand this just briefly so we can maybe see what's going on here. So I'm going to play, uh, you know, middle C here. And I'm holding it down. No nothing's happening while I'm holding it down. It doesn't, it doesn't know that it's being held down or anything like that. It just knows that a key was pressed down. So it says uh, MIDI message received. Type note on. Source, this is a, an identifier that tells it what device it came from. This device happens to have this particular source identifier. Channel, it arrived on channel zero. The MIDI specification allows for notes and controller messages to arrive on one of 16 channels. Don't have to worry about that too much. Um, I find that you can usually just ignore the channels in a lot of cases. Uh, the note number was 60. And the value, and this corresponds to what's called velocity, it's how hard I press the note down, is 127. And that's the maximum value. So now I'm going to release the key. And we've received a note off message. It's got the same source ID, obviously. It came from the same device. Still on channel 0, same note number. And there was a note off velocity, which is how fast I released the key. So I'm just going to, let's see, let's just do something. Let's clear the post window, and I'm just going to press and hold down three notes in succession, sort of quietly. So C, D, E. Uh, yeah, that, that made sense. So that was note number 60. D is note number 62, because it's two half steps above. And then 64, which is E. That's the next one. And these all had similar velocities, 58, 60, 59. I'm pretty consistent. And now I'm going to release them in the, let's clear the post window. Now let's leave it, leave it where it is. We're going to release them in the opposite order. So E first. So note off, sorry, for note 64. Note off for 62. And finally, note off for 60. All right? And we can just mash these all day. And it's tracking all those numbers. You're seeing we get this, this flurry of note on and note off. And this is just a way to visualize all the mess. I don't know. I would always make some MIDI funk and, and bring the message in that way. And, but this is way easier. You can just say, just post everything that comes in, just so I can see what's actually coming in. No, there's aftertouch. There's aftertouch, but I think this device does not send aftertouch. Uh, it's not the fanciest device on the market. I, I know that the, uh, like the DX11 and the DX7, I'm pretty sure those those are full featured. They they just want to show off the entire spec. So after touch, for those who are curious, is you press a key and then you press on it harder, and uh, that gives you um uh uh it hmm that is a mystery. Um yeah, I, I'm surprised. It could be that that. I that there's no way that Trace just randomly ignores aftertouch. Uh are you sure your device has aftertouch enabled? Like it's actually actively sending aftertouch? Because that, that would probably explain it. I don't know. We can we can figure that out. But um yeah, so yeah, aftertouch is when you press a key and then while it's held down, you have additional expressive control. So aftertouch again is zero with the least pressure and then when you lean into it, it gives you 127 with the most pressure. And you can then map those values to something else like vibrato or distortion or some other sound parameter. Okay, so let's turn a knob, right? I'm just going to take this knob here and just turn it a tiny bit. And it was, it was turned up all the way, 
So we got a quick succession of values, 125, 124, 122, 121, 120. Let's turn it all the way down. And there we go. So this is continuous controller number 22. This knob is associated with what's called CC22. Again, it's on channel zero. It's a control type message and the value corresponds to the knob position. And like all, uh, all values in MIDI, with a few exceptions, this is a, a, a seven bit value. So two to the seventh is 128. So we have values between zero and 127. So this next knob does the same thing. The difference is that it sends on a different controller, 23. This one sends for some reason on 61. And this one sends on 24. And the key to remember here is that these are just numbers. You know, there's don't, don't try to analyze it too deeply. Uh, these are just numbers. This is the controller number here is 26 and the value just goes from one to 27. When you're in a language like Super Collider, it's totally up to you, whatever you want to do with these numbers. So you just get all these great values coming in and you can map them to, to whatever you like. Um, oh, these, these buttons here that are sort of right below the faders. Uh, if you press them, they only have two values. 120, uh, interesting. Uh, okay. Oh, this is sending multiple things here. I think, yeah, okay. So this, again, this is, all MIDI devices are sort of unique. And this one has a button labeled auto. And when it's on, it acts like a, a control surface for your DAW, where these will control faders and these will control pan in your DAW. And now they behave like what I expected. They uh, send uh, a control message actually sends on channel 15 instead of zero, number 57, value 127, and we release, value goes to zero. So unlike these faders, which can go all the way, all the integers between zero and 127, these buttons just send zeros and 127s all day long. All right, so that's a, that's a, uh, that's a taste of MIDI messages. We can uh, set this back to false. Actually, let's uh, just so we don't delete any code here. Right, so now we have turned off our trace, nothing, okay? But that's okay, we're gonna start playing with these uh, MIDI data very shortly. Okay, I see some questions here. So unfearing, that's a good question, I basically don't know. Uh, that, that, I mean, you know, that'd be interesting, but I, I don't think I know quite enough about uh, multi-threading. Uh, I've never really had reason to investigate at that level. Um, uh, yeah, these, these buttons, when we were out of auto mode, they were sending uh, control messages and program change messages. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, these uh, the, the useful stuff are the, the keys, the knobs, and the faders, and, and that's what we're going to do. Okay, so... Uh, that, that's all, that's all well and good. Um, post all incoming messages. Super. Let's get into it. We're going to make a MIDI def. The one thing I, I don't like about <laughs> MIDI def is compared to synth def, synth def has a capital D, MIDI def has a lowercase d, and that's always bothered me just because it's inconsistent. Uh, so I don't know why that was done. I would always expect it to be a capital D, but uh, it's, it's MIDI def. So in MIDI def, the, the class method we provide to create a new instance, we actually choose. We could do .new, but uh, in the help file here, it says um, normally, normally one would use one of the message type specific convenience methods below rather than use this new method directly. So we're going to just gloss right over new. And instead, here we have a bunch of class methods which create a new MIDI def of a specific type. So MIDI def dot cc will uh, create a new MIDI def which responds to MIDI control messages. And then we open up our parentheses and the first thing we need is a key. 
and the key is the symbolic name. It's got the backslash, just like a synthdef. So we're just going to call this CC test. That's fine. We'll just call it CC test. Um, and then the next thing is a function. Right? Now, and then it says uh, see the new for argument descriptions. So function, this is the, um, this is the, yes, the function here is code to be evaluated when a control change message is received by SuperCollider. And let's look at the uh, function here. Uh, a function uh, which will respond to the incoming message when evaluated for note on, note off, control, and poly aftertouch messages it will be passed the arguments val, num, chan, and source. And we've seen these already. Val is the actual value of the continuous controller, you know, 0 to 127. Uh, num is the controller number associated with this particular knob. We saw that this one was 22. Chan, which is the channel the message is arriving on. And source, which is source identifier. Or it's the, you know, the integer source identifier that tells you what device was coming from. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to pass in four arguments. This is just like when we did like, you know, 10.do and we pass in the actual item or a collection.do. We pass in the item and the index by simply declaring two arguments. And uh, we do not have to name, name them these names. Uh, I tend to do that just for consistency, but you can call these, you know, A, B, C, D. It doesn't matter. But so we'll, we'll pass all four arguments in. So we'll say controller value, controller number, controller channel, or what channel the message is on, and source, semicolon. And the first thing we're going to do is just say val uh, num chan source dot post ln. And then we end the function. And in fact, we can end the MIDI def right there. Close that out and close the whole thing in parentheses. Right. And so again, just nothing coming in, turning a knob, nothing, nothing, nothing. Let's evaluate this. And now, ah, that's what we wanted to see. So this is a nice sort of compact array. So this knob here is number 22. It sends 0 to 127. Let's turn another knob. Here we go. This one's 23. Next one's 61. Right. Now these notes don't do anything, these pads don't do anything, because they don't send continuous control messages, they send note on and note off messages. So that's the basics. Uh, what we can do is, um, I think, what is it, mididef.c, no, maybe it's mididef with no argument, cctest.remove? Nope. Free? Yes. Right. All right. So again, we can just create this. There it is. We're getting MIDI data in. Our def, our MIDI def is active, and there it's gone. And you know, obviously, we we can't unfree. That's not a that's not a thing. Uh, so if you want to just simply disable a MIDI def, you can just disable it. So now it's disabled, but it is not freed. It's just inactive. So we can enable, and then we have it again. Right? All these faders, and then we can just disable and enable. And this is really handy. You know, you can have a, a, a MIDI def that responds to note on messages and produces a certain type of sound. And then if you want to switch the type of sound, you disable that MIDI def and enable a different one. Okay. Now, uh, you know, we could, and we could just replace this with anything like hello.postln. And there we go. We just get a lot of hellos. We could even, uh, you know, scramble this so that it's different every time. So yeah, this this is a, th this function here is just code to be evaluated when a message corresponding to the type of MIDI def 
comes in. Um, okay, everybody with me so far? Uh, let's see what's next. So we've gotten a CC message. Um, we have posted the value. Um, before we get into note on messages and note off messages, let's uh, let's make a sound. We're gonna notice that the server has been quit this whole time. We haven't even touched the server. MIDI is is language side. The server doesn't know anything at all about MIDI. It doesn't understand MIDI messages. Uh, it's these are language side objects. So uh, now we're gonna actually boot the server, and let's make a quick synth def. Oh, actually, and just just to be clear here, uh, let's let's quickly make a MIDI funk just so I can show the difference. Um, now, if we uh, let's see, so yeah, let's uh, MIDI funk. The difference with MIDI def and MIDI funk is that for MIDI funk we don't provide a symbol. We're sort of responsible for providing our own global variable name. So uh, yeah, I think the if I'm correct, the difference is that the first argument for MIDI funk.cc is just you just get the function initially, and um, it's sort of like making a new synth. And that if you want to be able to refer to that synth as it's playing later on, you need to give it a name. You need to call it something so that you can refer to it. And it's the same with MIDI funk. So here we can do this. And now I believe, right, there we go. We've got our, uh, actually, let's free that. Oh, we. the problem is this This one was still active. Our, I never uh, reevaluated this. So that's, we've, we've freed that one. It's gone. Now we have nothing. And the problem was that this MIDI funk didn't actually post anything. Right, so now this action is a value. So equivalent objects, I tend to prefer MIDI def because they're a little bit better for like on the fly programming. Notice if we if we change this and then were to reevaluate it, we have this problem where we had an old MIDI funk which we never got rid of, and now we've used that same global variable name to create a new one, uh, and that's sort of sloppy. But here. When you reevaluate this MIDI def, it just overwrites the previous one that was stored with this symbolic name. So I, I just, I would say, just go with um, uh, MIDI def just for consistency. There's really no reason to learn both of these. I mean, they're, they're both very similar. So I think we can do that. Yeah, and we have cleaned that up. So let's just destroy that. Get rid of that code. Boot the server, and now it's time for synth def. Uh, let's see, called sound. Arc uh, freak equals 440. Sig. Uh, let's make a, a gate argument as well. And sig equals pink noise. Uh, two. We'll just make a simple env gen with an ADSR envelope. Uh, we're fine with the default gate done action two. And let's see, let's do sig equals BPF. So we're gonna fan pass filter uh, this white noise. Just uh, and we're gonna ramp up the amplitude a little bit. You know, eh, let's just let's just uh, eyeball this. I'm being really sloppy here. Um, and let's just for starters, we're gonna set this kind of low out zero sig. Maybe this is a little bit more complex than we need, but that's okay. So. I think we'd be fine if we just uh, set this like that, maybe bring this up to 15, just to have a nice healthy level. Okay, so now the question is, let's let's use our uh, 
midi-def.cc to control this sound. Uh, so what we're going to do is we'll say uh, we want to control the frequency, for example. So we'll say x dot set, uh, and then we'll say freak. And now, uh, well, I mean, let's see. As we uh, comment, let's just get rid of this for a second, and let's just post the uh, value. Right. So the value goes from zero to one twenty-seven. So a sensible thing to do here is val dot lin exp. 0, 127, map this linear range onto 250 to 1,000. Okay, and now let's go ahead and make this sound and then evaluate this. And now, oh, it's actually also post the value. We can do it here. And let's try a different knob. So, you know, <laughs> they all work. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting uh, little side effect there. Okay, but that's, that's, again, we're starting with the basic stuff here. Yes, they are all controlling the same sound. And that is because this MIDI def is not selective beyond just only accepting continuous control messages. The way we have this currently set up is that this MIDI def responds to all continuous control messages. Doesn't matter where they're coming from. If it's a continuous control message, take the value from that controller and map it onto this frequency value and use it to set X. So yes, they're all controlling the same sound. We can fix that though. Um, let's, let's say we want to only, okay, ah, and here's another problem. This, the MIDI def is still active, so it's still evaluating this code, but it's saying failure in server node not found because we used x.set to set the gate to zero. So, yeah, you know, that's, that's sort, of a, sort of an issue here. The solution I usually go with is, uh, when all this is a sort of a clever trick here when you create a synth you can say and let's let's just remove this midi def for now when you create a synth you can add dot register and what this does is it uh, registers the synth with an object called node watcher and when you register a synth it allows you to do stuff like x dot is playing and that's true and if we set the gate to zero and then say is playing, well, now it's false. So with registering synths, we can then uh, use some conditional logic here. We can say if x is x dot is playing, if that is true, do that. Right? Otherwise, do nothing. So now. There's no harm, there's no weird error messages or anything like that. And we can just create this sound. Yeah, and we just fade it out and it doesn't matter if we're moving the knob, no ugly error messages. So that's that problem fixed. But uh, the other problem we wanna fix is, you know, what good is a MIDI controller if all the knobs and faders, you know, are basically acting as one knob or fader. You know, they're all basically the same. They're indistinguishable to the computer. So let's go ahead and fix that. There are two ways to do it. One is to use conditional logic in the MIDI def function. <laughs> yeah, the register is one of those one of those clever things where you can just uh, uh, yeah, it took me a while to learn that one too. It's very handy for a lot of cases. Um, right, so the, the first way that you can, which I think is a little bit maybe not not quite as clean, is to use conditional logic in the uh, MIDI def function. You know, we could we actually actually add to this conditional test. Whoa, we can add to this conditional test. We say this has to be true. X has to be playing, and double ampersand uh, num equals twenty two. Right? 
because uh, if you will recall, let's comment this out briefly. Uh, num.postln, that is 22. This first knob here, that's 22. That's what we're going to use. So we're just checking to make sure that's the case. By the way, if you highlight code and press command forward slash, the same symbol we use for commenting, it'll comment out the selection. Same hotkey for uncommenting. So that's another little nifty trick. So now, you know, we, we see nothing. We see nothing. Let's, um, in addition to setting this, we'll also say function evaluated dot post ln because we're only going to see this post ln if this function is evaluated. So turning knobs, pushing buttons, doing all sorts of stuff, nothing, right? Until uh, we actually, because and, and the reason that's not working is because x is not playing, right? X is, has been uh, freed. So we'll just do this. And now, very good. But none of these other knobs have any effect whatsoever. Nothing, right? So that's exactly what we want. Okay. Well, let's do something a little bit more complex and then we'll move on to uh, note on and uh, note off messages. Uh, funny, Microsoft Visual Studio comment block macros control KC. Oh, weird. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, you can you can map hotkeys and you know, however you want to do that. So if you if you're really used to that, you can go into uh, shortcuts, I think, and probably here somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, toggle comment. So you can make this a custom keyboard shortcut if you like. If your fingers are hard coded to do that. All right. Um, okay. So the more complex thing we're gonna do, and I'm just gonna sort of uh, figure this out as we go, is I'm going to make an array of eight synths with different frequencies. And uh, we're going we're gonna to add an amplitude argument here. Okay, so we've added an amplitude argument. And I'm going to have these eight knobs control the amplitude of eight different bandpass filters, filtering at a different frequency. So instead of x equals synth.new, we're going to say x equals... Uh, the array 200, 400, dot, dot, 1600. That gives us an array of eight numbers. Dot do. No, 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 sorry. Dot collect. Because we want to return this modified array. Um, and uh, which is going to contain eight synths. So what we want to do here is in our synth call, we provide uh, arrays here, and we want to say freak is equal to freak, right? Freak is the value passed in from this array of eight items. So the first time through, it's 200. And the second time through, it's uh, 400, etc. And we're going to leave all the amps at 1. Uh, so, is there anything else we need to do? I don't think so. And we're going to register all of these synths. Uh, actually, let's initialize their amplitudes to zero, just so we can make these synths and then hear ourselves think. All right, so we have added our synth def, just to be sure. And now, bring up our good friend, the node tree. And what we should see when we run this code is eight synths. And it looks like we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We don't hear anything because their amplitudes are zero. All right, that's good. Now we need to change this MIDI def. And, you know, I guess why don't we be a little bit clean here and we will just add a new version here. We'll call it something else. Well, we'll we'll disable the CC test object just in case it's still floating around, and we'll call this uh, uh, amp bank. Right, so uh, amp bank control. 
So this MIDI def is going to be responsible for taking the MIDI data that comes from these four knobs and mapping them appropriately. And I, I need to just, uh, we're going to trace this real quick. I just want to remember these numbers that are coming in. So we're tracing. And so the first one is controller 22, 23, 61, 24, uh, 26, 27, 62, 95. I already forgot those. 26, 27, 62, 95. Okay, so these are the controller numbers here. So let's see, what's the best way to do this? Uh, we pass the values in. And uh, yeah, so this, this conditional logic approach of actually saying only evaluate, you know, evaluate the function no matter what, but each time internally, we're gonna check to make sure we're only using the correct controller numbers. So let's go back a sec. Uh, this is MIDI funk, this is MIDI def. Notice that in the uh, cc method, right, you have your key, that's your name, you have your function, and then you have cc num, that's a third argument. And uh, where am I going here? Oh yeah, up here. So cc num or message number, an integer indicating the MIDI message number, for example, note number, control number, or program number for this MIDI def. This can be an array. So Basically, what, I, what this is saying here is, let's just forget about this for a second. Um, and uh, yeah, after the function, we can provide this array of numbers, and it will only respond to continuous controllers that match one of these items here. You know, we could just as, just as similar, you know, put 22, it'll only respond to 22. Um, so let's do this. And so now we can just simply say, uh, see uh, I guess a case is probably the best way to do this um you know what no I got a better idea uh, let's call this you know um, knob nums okay so now we have that as a global variable and now what we can say is knobs knob nums dot index of 22, and this should return zero. And 23 returns one, 95 returns seven. So now we can actually get the index of an item. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. There's probably some really, really slick iterative way to do this, but I'm just not quite seeing it at the moment. So we want to say, you know, X, which is our collection of synths. Uh, oh, you know what? Okay, knob nums dot do arg. And then we want to, okay, so yeah, we're just going to iterate over this array of numbers, and we're gonna say x at knob nums dot index of knob num dot set amp uh, val divided by 127, and then close that. Okay, um, let's take a step back. So this MIDI def only responds to these, which are saved in knob nums. And every time a value from one of these controllers is received, it executes its function and iterates over the array of controllers. And for this one, 22 is passed in here, uh, here, sorry. And this returns the index of that item in the array. This returns zero. And so x at zero, remember x is a collection of eight synths, which is gonna be the 200 hertz one. And we're gonna set that amplitude equal to the value, 
which is going to range between 0 and 127, and we're just dividing by 127. So this is a really quick way of just scaling it between 0 and 1. Okay? Here we go. Uh, uh, they're all controlling the same synth, I think. Let's just start over here. So, uh, let's just, uh, okay. So if we say x, uh, x at one dot set amp 0.5. Uh mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh it's setting all of their amplitudes. We do this. Yeah, so we're getting a harmonic series here. Uh, just x dot do. Um, okay, let's uh, just comment some stuff out here. And let's just post this value. Right, every time um, yeah, every time we get a new value, we're getting zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So uh we want to say x at that value dot set. Uh yeah, oh. Oh, yeah. I think you're right. Yes. Thank you, R618. I was losing it for a second. I was about to, like, go back to clunky case statements or something. Good call. Um, okay. So now this, I think this should work. Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, I commented the wrong thing out. Um, uh, knob num. Um, although, let's find the synth directly. X at I'm just I'm missing something obvious here. Um, anyway, if anyone can can uh, uh, figure this out and paste in the code to me, I uh, I uh, that would be great. Um, yeah, we're we're gonna get ugly here, but that's okay. Uh, you know. Um, nums. Okay, let's. Oh, num, 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 num. N yeah, right. Yes, this is this should work. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Wow, I made that way more complicated than it was supposed to be. 
but all right, we got through it. Um, so that's a little bit uh, more complex of an example. I really walked into that one backwards. All right. I guess we can all sort of digest that on a uh, on the rewatch. Sorry to take up some extra time there. Uh, let's let's move on to um, to uh, note numbers. Let's fade those out. There they go. Um, and if, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should have we should have done a conditional check for uh, uh, you know if we would check if x at zero is is. Or check all of them, make sure they're all running. So again, we're being kind of sloppy here. And you know, if you if you're not bothered by these failure messages, then you know, whatever. It's just uh I'll say MIDI def amp bank control dot free. Let's get rid of that for now. All right, so let's talk uh note on and note off messages. The way we do that note on. And again, we provide, uh, you know, uh, for, for note on, note off control, uh, we get val, num, chan, source. So another four arguments. <laughs> yeah, I get them too, you know? I mean, it's it's one of those things where if you're trying to send control messages to a synth that doesn't exist, you're not going to hurt anything. It's just, it's like, hey, it doesn't exist. You can't, you can't do anything. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should fix that. But, you know, it's not, not as bad as like dividing by zero for an amplitude value or something horrible like that. So, all right. So actually the first value here is the note velocity. It's the, the strength it's the, that you, you know, how quickly you press it down, how hard you play the key. So I usually call this vel, and then I'll call this num. You know, I know val, vel, such a minor difference, but... Um, and, you know, again, we'll just, uh, say, uh, num comma vel dot post ln. And there we go. So every time we press a note down, we get the number of the note. That was C sharp. It's got a number of 61 and I played it as hard as possible. So that's 127. We could play it really quietly. Just have a amplitude or velocity of 21. Let's see if we can get a value of one. If we just very oh, five. Okay. Can we get a one? I don't think so. It's as quiet as I can do it. Yeah. And if we go up a uh, chromatic scale here, you can see, you know, velocity values around 70, 80, 90, and semitones are just increments by one. So uh, let's, let's make a different synth def. And we are gonna, let's see, let's make this, um, instead of an nf.adsr, we're gonna do nf.perk. We don't need a gate. And done action two. Done action two is really important here because we're not listening to note off messages. And so we can't rely on the release to actually turn the sound off. So instead we just have these fixed duration envelopes uh, and Let's see. Sound perk. Here we go. Uh, can usually change response curves on velocity. Yeah. Um, I'd have to read the manual for this particular device to figure out how to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess you could do that. You could also map them, I guess, in Super Collider, although that's not really much of a solution. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we've got this. Um, let's just test it out real quick. Okay. Now, uh, what we want to do here is maybe we can just copy and paste this one or, or just change it up here for, for crying out loud. Uh, we want to say, well, when we get a note on message, synth.new, sound perk. And that's not all. If we if we just stop there, they all play the same note because we're not using the incoming MIDI data to, you know, determine specific characteristics here. So what we can do is set the frequency. Wow, it's not how you spell frequency at all. Frequency to num dot MIDI CPS. That's crucial. 
right? We don't want to use the raw value for uh, the frequency, right? Because those values are between zero and 127, so they're going to be all super low. So we actually want to MIDI CPS. And also these send note ons. All right. Uh, let's all let's let's uh, bring uh, velocity into the picture, right? Because we're notice that uh, we are just using the note number to control the frequency. So I can play this really quietly, or as hard as I can. And it's the same every time. But we have this amplitude argument, which is plugged in here. So uh, one thing to do here is let's multi-line this a little bit. Uh, amp vel. Let's actually do dot lin exp. We're going to go from 0 to 127 uh, to, let's say, 0 0.05 to 1. And now, well, why don't we, uh, I guess we can, we can post this, why not? I guess if we really want this to be louder, we can go up a little bit. Um, and you can use, you know, Lin Curve if you want to, uh, you know, and then you can provide this extra value here to change the steepness of the curve you know for example if we just map the values 0 127 and plot them you know with a curve of 10 this gives us this sort of shape so even even medium hard velocities here are still a low amplitude it's not until you get all the way up into like 126 127 that you'll get a high amplitude and you can similarly set this to like a negative value and that will give you this kind of curve. So even very, very gentle key presses give you significant amplitude. So you can use Lin Curve to very flexibly create a, um, you know, a velocity curve. This is what's called a velocity curve. Um, we're going to stick with, uh, I guess, Lin Exp and just do it this way because that was sounding pretty okay as far as I could tell. Uh... Yeah, so I do have a pedal connected right here. And when the pedal is connected to the back of the keyboard in the sustain pedal port, it just acts like the same as one of these buttons. It just sends, uh, let's, let's go ahead and trace. So I'm going to press the pedal down. As you can see, it's a control message, controller number 64 and value 127 and then when I release it's the same controller number and you get a value of zero so it's just a continuous control message it's no the only difference between that and these buttons uh, sorry these buttons here you know see these do this they're con this one's controller 57 this one's controller 64 with my foot so nothing too fancy going on there it's just a very simple two-step you know or, or uh, binary continuous controller yeah, and again, it's comp it's in totally up to us to make these incoming data do something, right? This pedal doesn't do anything. It all it does is send a mini message. So we we've got to, you know, it is possible to create some code that actually makes it act like a sustain pedal. the The logic would be something like uh, you'd have to keep track of all of the notes, all of the note on messages that have been received that haven't currently received a corresponding note off message. And when you press the pedal down, the program enters a state where it ignores note off messages. So even if you release the key, it doesn't 
listen to that note off message and you'll still have you know all of your all of your all of your sounds that have been triggered by note on messages will continue to play and then when you release the pedal uh it would need to um check if there are any keys that are not currently held down and then send note offs on those keys because if you're still holding down something then you obviously want it to sustain so it's actually a little bit complicated i've never Maybe once I, I went through the exercise of actually making the sustain pedal, ma making controller number 64 act like a sustain pedal. It's less simple than you'd think, uh, but it is possible. Um, okay, so uh, we were here, and now what, uh, what we're gonna do is incorporate some note off messages. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is maybe just sort of copy this code here. Um, make some room. Uh, call this note on test two. Uh, or no, we're just going to overwrite it. We're going to overwrite this. Um, we're going to change this to be sound ADSR. And we're going to go back to our ADSR envelope and gate it so that we can sustain it indefinitely. And that's good. So now if we say x equals sound.adsr, or yeah, synth.new sound adsr, we can say x, ooh, caps lock, x.set gate zero. All right, so now we have the ability to discreetly um, you know, it, uh, turn the note on, and it just plays indefinitely until we explicitly turn it off by setting its gate to zero. So the instinct here would be to uh, say something like x equals synth.new ADSR, and let's, for simplicity's sake, ignore amplitude, and then we will also make a corresponding MIDI def dot note off. And we're gonna call this note off test. And what it's going to do is say x dot set gate zero. And I'm gonna put a comment here saying this approach will not work correctly. And I wonder if anyone can tell me why. Um Okay, so let's do this. It seems to be working, right? Does anyone see the problem? How about now? So we had to sort of use our backup plan there by just setting all the nodes in the default group to zero. Uh, amplitudes are adding. No, I mean, like, if you mean we're having problems with clipping, not really. I mean, that that is something to consider, definitely. You don't want to... But the amplitude looks fine. But now we have these stuck notes, right? I mean, how do we... Okay, who can, who can earn 10 brownie points and tell me what's going on here? Anyone? The problem has to do with this and this. Let's imagine we get a note and we hold it down and then we play another note and hold that one down. That means this function gets evaluated, right? This, sorry, this, this one here. And we say x equals a new synth. Yeah, it is kind of a sustained pedal problem. Gate is zero. Mm. 
Yeah, I think N Parmar's got it right. Let's say we, we press a key, and now this synth here on the node tree, that's X. And if we, re if we bring the node up now, we run x.set, gate is zero, no problem. But let's play two notes. Now, uh, it's, it's only freeing one of them, right? So we can't, we can't do x.set anymore. We've already freed that one. They were both called x, and two things can't be called x. So, Uh, there's only one variable that's capable of remembering which controller was used. Yeah, the the problem is, when we get a note on message, we store a synth in the global variable x. And if we happen to get multiple notes in a row without any note offs, then x is now pointing to something else. And then x is pointing to another synth and another synth. And it only remembers the most recent one. And the rest of them become inaccessible because something stole their global variable name. And it's, that's mine now. I'm using it. You know, I'm X. No, I'm X. No, I'm X. So uh, this is a, this is not a, not a viable solution. The solution is instead of setting a single variable equal to X, you store the synth at a core, at a, at a, a unique index in an array. And MIDI is, is this sort of 7-bit system, so there are 128 different note numbers. So what we can do is um, declare, uh, let's say, um, let's call this, let's call this x, why not? Uh, no, you know what, let's call it synths. Array.newclear. Uh, or we can just, you know what, let's just say, uh, whatever, nuclear is fine, uh, 128. Okay, so now, uh, well, no, the, actually, the, in the MIDI specification, there are only 128 notes. I mean, this, this keyboard only has 49 keys. A piano keyboard has 88, and in the MIDI specification, there are you know, you could theoretically have a note number zero and note number 127. So there's only 128 possibilities. So this is always going to be sufficient. I think. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine a situation where, yeah, I think there's just there's just no way for the digital specification to accommodate 129 notes. It just doesn't work that way. That's the way it was designed. So now we are going to say x at num. Right, that's that's the key. So if we get note number 60, this synth gets stored at index 60 in the array. And here we say x at num dot set, gate zero. And I think that's all we need to do. So now, uh, no, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Um. Ha! <laughs> yes! Oh, 10 points to Parmar. See, this is, this is my problem, see? I just start renaming stuff for no good reason. That's why. That's totally why. You guys are very smart, thank you. What would I do without you? Okay, good. And this. Yeah, that's what we want. Pretty fun. Ah, oh, you guys all got it, and here I am just clunking around with X. I'm like, oh, this is weird. Why isn't it working? All right. So that is um, note ons. Uh, I tell you what. Uh, let's switch things up a little bit. Um, let's go ahead and just copy this. What I want to do is uh, uh, do, do our note on, note off stuff, but also have a continuous controller that controls some parameter of the sound. I'm, I'm just going to go with the resonant low pass filter because that's very fun. So onward, onward we go. And 
I guess for for um clean clean think we're gonna free all midi defs. It's a good good way to I mean you know we're new example here so we'll say uh, uh, resident low pass filter saw sig equals saw dot ar and frequency exclaim two you know we're gonna make a little bit of stereo interest here. So we're going to, you know, just detune one channel a little bit relative to the other. And we're going to say signal equals resonant low pass filter sig uh, cutoff frequency. Qu uh, we'll just keep the quality fixed at like 0.2. Seems pretty safe. Um, multiply by 0.5 because we are doing a little bit of resonance here. And... Oh, we need a uh, cutoff frequency. We will also set this, we'll set this equal to uh, just, I don't know, initially twice the, the fundamental frequency. Uh, I want this, I like I like low saw waves. What, what can I say? I'm, I'm a sucker for low sawtooth waves. So this uh, will sound. Now let's initially keep the amplitude low, play it safe so I don't, yeah. Um, so now uh, what we want to do is eventually get a controller to do stuff like this. So first things first, one thing at a time, one programming problem at a time. Let's uh, modify our note on and note off synth defs to behave correctly. Uh, freak, we'll do amp. Uh, velocity dot lin exp uh, 0, 127, 0 0.01 to 0 .0, 0 0.5. We're gonna turn. We're just keep this. Keep us a little bit quiet, because you know, if we have multiple multiple notes held down, they're all gonna sum together. So even 0.5, we might have to lower this even more. We'll we'll play it by ear. <laughs> I hope I'm blowing your mind in a good way. Uh, okay, and then yeah, we just use note offs to turn that off. So. Uh, oh, you know what? Gosh, we uh, we also need to initialize the cutoff frequency because the cutoff frequency is 120, right? So that's it's only going to allow frequencies at or below 120 hertz to pass through. And that's fine if we're playing super low notes, but these high notes have fundamentals that are above 120, and so they're going to be totally filtered out. So we're going to initialize the cutoff frequency to be uh, num dot midi CPS times 2, just twice the... Uh, so it's still going to be a very mellow sawtooth wave. Basically, the f fundamental and the second harmonic are going to be filtered through. So, and we have an octave there. This keyboard has octave transposition buttons, so we can just, you know. Let's initialize this to be the twelfth harmonic. Thank you. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's just sawtooth waves. They sound great. But it's gonna sound even cooler once we get this continuous controller working. That's gonna be the challenge. So uh, we're just gonna go ahead and add another MIDI def to our clump here. MIDI def dot cc, and you know let's let's uh, start with one thing at a time here. We'll call this uh, uh, cc test. You know, as names, bane of my existence. Arg value number channel source. And do keep in mind that if you're not going to be using channel and source, don't feel compelled to declare them as arguments. If you're not going to use them, there's just no need. I'm just being consistent here, just in case we ever want to use the channel or the source ID. You know, they're there. 
And uh, at the end of this function, we're going to say 22. 22, just to say mididef.cc, you are only listening to this knob here, only if the number is 22. And so now we can just assume we're getting this one. And OK, but here's a um, couple ways we could do this. One way we can, uh, if we want to actually synth, uh, we, can, we can iterate over the array of synths and pass in, you know, each individual synth as we iterate over this array of 128 items. And we can say uh, synth.set uh, cf val.linexp. Um, uh, 0127 and you know I guess we'd like to keep this um, related to the frequency so maybe we should actually redesign our synth def uh, uh, frequency times harmonic okay so we're a little redesign here instead of specifying the cutoff frequency explicitly you know or not explicitly independently uh, so as a separate value, totally unrelated to frequency, we're going to provide a harmonic number. So harmonic 2 is twice the fundamental frequency, harmonic 3, 3 times. And so this way, by coding it this way, we're, we're hard coding these together, right? This, um, um, w this one is, you know, the, the resulting value here is dependent on frequency. So we'll say harmonic equals 2 initially. And... Yeah, I think this will work. So here we just want to say harmonic 2. Right, so, and we'll finish this up. We'll say it will range between 1 and 16. I think that's fine. Right? Um, nope. Uh, we forgot. So, oh, we forgot to close the do. There we go. We've closed our do. So we're, every time we get a continuous controller value from this knob, every time we nudge this knob, we iterate over all 128 synths and set whatever synths happen to exist, set their value, set their, uh, nope, set their harmonic. Harmonic. That's why we review our code. Set the harmonic to be somewhere between 1 and 16 based on, uh, you know, and these are going to be fractional decimal values, you know, so if it's like, a value of 1, that gives us a harmonic of 1.022, you know, a value of 40 gives us a harmonic 2.3, etc. So, all right. Oh, I hope this works. No, 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 not quite. Uh, did I reevaluate this? I might have not reevaluated that. So it's mostly working. But it's not quite working. Uh, here, see if I can explain why. So I'm going to play a note, and now I'm going to turn this knob. This knob is currently in a very high position, so I'm just going to nudge it. Right? Down, up, down, up, release, and let's play it again. Yeah. So the oh, and we're getting a lot of of these, so I guess we should register. You know, uh, eh, okay, we'll fix that later. We'll fix that later if we feel like it. Man, I know I'm being kind of sloppy here, but um, so um, the problem is every time we get a note on, we, you know, basically plunk a new synth into our array and the harmonic value is 
always initialized at two. But if the knob is way up here, you know, this MIDI dev doesn't know. It says, okay, you're initially two. And then when we turn this knob, so all of a sudden it goes from like a value of 127 down to 126. And then this controller says, oh, hey, set the harmonic, you know, to some high value. And uh, so we, we would like to fix that so that when we turn this knob up, the program actually keeps track of that data and says, you know, the current knob position is, is way up here. And then use that data that we're tracking when we initialize the synth. And uh, so the, the simple way to do that is whenever we get a controller number, let's say CC22 equals val. Okay, so now when we turn this knob here, I'm gonna, we're just gonna check our value by just highlighting it right here in the code. I'm gonna turn the knob all the way down. Now it's zero, turn the knob all the way up. Now this value, so this value is, is now being tracked in the language. So what we can do then is take this code here, paste it up here, and say uh, CC22. Set the harmonic equal to the current position of this knob, which is always being tracked whenever we move it, but of course map it in the same way from 0 to 127 onto 1 and 16. Um, so yeah, so now if we turn this, let's start at, the, at a low position. And now if we release these and play them again, it remembers. Down. So, and let's, let's address these failure in server node not found messages. The reason we're getting those is because uh, when we, uh, when we, uh, let's say, let's say we get a note on message. Let's play, you know, this note here. And now, no, let's try a different one. Uh, let's start, stop all this for a second. Okay, so that's working. So initially, this is, uh, you know, empty here. So let's play a note. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, oh, okay. I, I didn't mean to be evaluating this whole line. I was, uh, I was clearing the entire array and then we, we, were, we wouldn't be able to actually turn them off. Okay, so here's our array of synths. Right now it's full of nils. I'll play a note and then reevaluate. And there you go. You can see we actually have uh, a synth, right? At, at a corresponding index, corresponding to, you know, whatever, 36 or something. Uh, and now if we release it and check the array again, it's still there. It's still there. It's not playing, but we never, I mean, we, we said put a synth here and that causes the server to make some sound and then we free that synth. But language side, nothing updates this. Nothing says, by the way, you're now nil again. We could do it manually. We could, every time we get a note off, I think this would work. After we set the gate to zero, we say synths at num equals nil. Let's try this. Um, so here's this. There's our synth. And right, there it is. Now let's release. And now it's nil. So what, what we could do then is uh, when we iterate over the synths, we'll say if uh, synth dot not nil, right? That's a little conditional trick you can use. If that's the case, then it must be a synth, right? So set its harmonic. Uh, otherwise, do nothing. All right, so we're, we're iterating over the synths. If anything is nil, this gets glossed over. Right, and just just to to show you here, two dot not nil. Oh, that's true. Two is not nil at all. If we say nil dot not nil, well, that's false. Sorry, sorry, buddy. That's nil. So I think this should get rid of our node not found messages.
All right, so uh, that's we've gotten through quite a bit of stuff here. Um, you know, there there are lots of avenues we could continue pursuing. We could get this pitch wheel to uh, control pitch bend, so that we can actually, you know, you know, we're using this in a very very conventional sense, but um, you know, uh, we could we could also make this mod wheel do something. We have all these controllers here, right? We're just using one. We're just using this one knob right here, and you know, it's giving us. A lot of fun. So, uh, but you know, maybe, maybe I guess on the in-class problems and um, take home. You know, I won't do too much. I know because the midterm is next week. But uh, yeah, I just um, this might be a good place to stop or uh, stop and or take questions if anyone is sort of following along and struggling a bit or or has any sort of questions. Uh, Right. I mean, the, the bottom line is, you know, MIDI is just data. It comes into Super Collider via these MIDI def objects, which are listening for certain types of messages and sometimes with additional selectivity. So only listening to certain notes or only listening to certain controller numbers. And then it's just up to you to design a synth def with a sufficient number of arguments. You know, we could, we could add an, a sine wave that modulates the frequency so that we could have a little bit of wavering vibrato and then we could map one of these controllers to that as well um so yeah i mean it's just you you design the sound and you decide how to map those values one example i've, I've shown for uh for students in the past and maybe i'll ask you all to do this is to you know just make a simple synth def that's has a percussive envelope so you can just ignore note ons and um, uh, just uh, map velocity to note number and note number to velocity. So the higher up on the keyboard you get, the louder it is. And the harder you press a single key, the higher the pitch is. Like you press it really quietly, it's a low pitch. It's a really weird, and then the piano just behaves completely weird. You, just, you have no idea how to play it anymore. You, you can't play a C major chord to save your life. Uh, it's pretty, pretty funky. So uh, yeah, maybe maybe that's a that's a fun example. You know, it's just basically what you'll end up doing is, uh, you know, set the frequency to some value determined by velocity instead of note number, and set the amplitude to be some value determined by note number. Um, you know, or maybe you can you can find some other creative ways to to do stuff. So I hope that was reasonably clear to everyone. As we sort of wrap up here, the um, uh, the corresponding tutorial on my tutorial series on YouTube is tutorial number nine. It covers a lot of the same stuff. It's you know more compact, less of me goofing around and making stupid mistakes. Um, so yep, yeah, watch that one. I, I also incorporate the uh, pitch the pitch wheel. The way we do that, let's quickly just uh, just for fun. We will bring in, we're not going to make it do anything, but we'll make a MIDI def dot bend. And bend test. And in this case, we only pass in three arguments because there's only three pieces of data uh, for, yeah, for after touch, program change, and bend messages. It will be passed only value, channel, and source. So val chan source and we will just post val so now we move the pitch wheel and this is one of the few exceptions to really maybe the only exception is that the values here are 14 bit values instead of uh, 7 bit values so instead of going from 0 to 128 it goes from 0 to 2 to the power of 14 minus 1, right? 16, 383. Uh, 2 power 14. Right. So it's actually, there's actually two bytes being used, and the, the first bit in each byte is, not, is used for something else, but the, the remaining seven bits in these two bytes sum to be 14 bits, which gives us this 14-bit value. The reason for this is that it provides additional resolution for pitch bending. Because if you were to sort of bend between two octaves and you only had 128 discrete steps, 
then you're going to have this sort of staircase sound. It's not going to be a smooth glissando because you only have so many resolution points. But with Pitch Wheel, here you have, you know, tons and tons of data to play with. So, uh, yeah, anyway. So that's, I think that's that's the reasoning behind it. Uh, I'm not actually seeing the full full spectrum here. I, there's, there's probably a little bit more that meets the eye as far as accessing these these two bytes. No. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, we're about halfway through the semester. I think there's going to be 13 or 14 videos in total. Uh, probably no stream next Wednesday because uh, the class that has the midterm scheduled, so I'm not going to introduce a new topic, but uh, just focus on sort of reviewing the stuff we've covered. Um, maybe I'll I'll come on stream, but I'm not going to do a new topic. And then after the midterm, the topics are. I guess we can we can look at the syllabus real quick. If I could pull that up. Let me get this real quick. So here's the tentative uh, stuff I have planned. So we've covered introduction, the audio server, synthesis basics, buffers, architecture. Today we're doing MIDI. Uh, so we have the midterm. Then we're going to talk about patterns, routines, tasks, clocks, and scheduling. It's kind of a big topic. Patterns may end up being a second lecture because there's a really there's a lot to talk about there, and it's it's basically the the shining star of the super collider platform then we're going to talk about graphical user interface design you know basically uh you know you can say w equals window dot new dot front hey look at that we have a window and then we can put knobs and sliders and stuff on it and i think that's a really fun topic i think people enjoy that so then we're going to talk about osc and i got a really fun lecture planned for that uh, I have my iPad, I've got Touch OSC installed, and I have a way to show it on stream. And uh, it's OSC is like MIDI, but like a million times better. It's higher resolution, it's faster, it's wireless, it's good stuff. There's in SuperCloud, there's a pen class, which allows you to draw on Windows, and you can do sort of algorithmic drawing stuff. We have Fall Break, uh, we'll do some integration with DAWs, and then tentatively some ideas relating to live coding and then you know whatever is left over so something like that that's that's sort of the plan with uh with the rest of the semester um, and a lot of these topics have corresponding pre-made tutorial videos on my youtube channel that you can watch so these are just more to teach my class and you know actually interact with my students and other viewers in real time yeah, no problem. And thank you also for helping with that uh, amplitude bank iteration problem. I uh, I had some some wires crossed in my head, so I really appreciate you and everyone else who was jumping in with with this problem here. That was yeah, I made that a little more complicated than uh. Which DAWs? I'm probably gonna do Logic just because I'm on Mac OS and I have Logic, and that's the one that I'm most familiar with. Uh, what I'm gonna cover for that. Is well, you remember when we um, when we listed the um, sources, uh, and we have my keyboard, and we also have the IAC driver, and this is a built-in Mac OS thing that allows you to pass MIDI from uh, one one software to another. So what we can actually do is use patterns and MIDI output in Super Collider to algorithmically generate like notes and control data and stuff, and we can use it to control some plugin running in a DAW. So this is something that will apply to all DAWs. But if you're on Windows, uh, that's that's the only sort of snag. The IAC driver is a Mac thing. I think there exists software that allows you to pass MIDI uh, between software on, on Windows. Um, and hopefully my Windows users, students can get that running. I mean, you know, we have Macs at school, so yeah, we have we have labs and you've got access to the studio. So there's always some sort of workaround. I never really like when there's a topic that's like specific to one operating system. And one of the great things about SuperCollider is it runs on all three main primary operating systems. Um, so I don't know, but I still think it's a useful topic to cover. And, uh, you know, this IEC driver that's covered in my tutorial 18, I think. So 
yeah, that's the plan, anyway. See, I, I just have this instinct to reach for the pitch wheel, but of course, it's not going to do anything because we haven't programmed it to do anything. Yeah. But that's in tutorial 9. So if those of you who are interested, uh, do, you know, those of you who are my students, I'm requiring you to watch that. But for anyone in general, um, you know, it's same, same, very similar concept to what we've done. Uh, sorry, not there. Uh, here, right? We just, instead of a MIDI to FCC, we have a bend, and we just check to make sure the synths are, in fact, running and alive. And then we set some other argument. We'd have to build in, you know, like, bend equals zero. And then we'd, you know, apply it to, you know, bend.midi ratio or something. Because zero dot MIDI ratio is one. And then if we set bend to two, you know, then this gets multiplied by a ratio corresponding to two semitones. And, you know, that would be the starting point on that. And, uh, yeah, so. And thanks, Jake, for posting that, uh, yeah, loop, loop B. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I feel like I looked this up. There might even be some information in the description on Tutorial 9 on YouTube about uh, options for, for Windows users. And for Linux, there's probably also a solution as well. But my my general way of working is if you're on Linux, then you know what you're doing and you don't need my help. Um, yeah, whether or not that's true, I don't know. But Okay, so anyway, um, I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And um, I tentatively probably no stream tomorrow just because there's going to be no new topics. But... Uh, you know, you can always post questions and stuff on my on my YouTube videos, and uh, we'll see everybody in class who's taking the class. Yeah, so I think I'm going to close up shop for the night. Thank you all for watching. And for 99C students, I'll see you in class tomorrow. I am going to go a little bit lighter on the, I know I keep saying that, but this time I really mean it, on the in-class and the take, especially the take-home, just because... I assume you'll be sort of reviewing previous assignments in preparation for the midterm, which, you know, should not be that burdensome. I'm going to try to keep everything sort of brief to the point, not ask you to do anything, no crazy backflips and coding acrobatics. Um, so anyway, thanks again, everybody. And I'm getting out of here. Thanks for watching. And I will see you all next time.